Too much aggravation, <laughs> self-inflicted or otherwise. <laughs> um, just one, one or two, uh, one or two things. Um, looking back, in uh, I always try to look back in things that are relevant to tonight's speaker. But I was looking at uh, naval history, and uh, tomorrow, um, the ninth of January. Very well in this talk. The ninth, the, the ninth of January. <laughs> Um, was Nelson's funeral at St Paul's oh, Cathedral. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Something I didn't know, but then again I wasn't around in 1806. <laughs> um, and also, uh, on the 5th of January, British operation to capture the Cape of Good Hope uh, was begun by a squadron under Commodore Sir Home Popham. So there you go. <laughs> More recently, 16 years ago, the Queen officially named RMS Queen Mary II, the largest ocean liner ever built. Uh, and it's uh, the, uh, the only liner that still flies between Southampton and New York. Whether regularly or irregularly, I don't know, but uh, it still does. But I mean, the old Queen Elizabeth and the old Queen Mary, I worked in Southampton docks at that particular time, and I saw them both sail away. Wow. But bringing us on to tonight's speaker, Mr. Gary Rowe. Sorry, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't afford Kate Winslet or uh, Leo DiCaprio, but Gary said he was free, so we said, OK. Well, they asked me, do you come in their place? You can, you, can, you can pop along, and he has popped along. And Gary is going to talk to us about the Titanic conspiracy. So welcome, Gary. Thank, Thank you very much. much. <laughs> well, I hope you've all brought one of these with you, because you're definitely going to need it tonight, okay? Excuse me, all wired. I don't feel like I'm on, you know, Gunny Row, News at 10, ITV. <laughs> right, now you're going to forgive me, I'm going to sit if you don't mind, because much easier to try and work this and work that. Normally I prefer just to give a talk without any notes, but it's impossible with this, because it's absolutely vital that everything I tell you is deadly accurate. Especially as you're a history society. I wouldn't want anybody to come up after and say, you've got that bit wrong, you know. <laughs> we can't have that. So I am. Here we go. Uh, my name is Gary, and I've actually been investigating uh, conspiracy theories and mysteries for 60 years. This is just one of them. So I am not an expert in uh, maritime stuff or anything, but during my investigation of the conspiracy of the Titanic, I obviously have to learn a lot about it, and I'm going to pass on to you tonight what I discovered about it, which may surprise you. Hands up if you've seen the film Titanic. <laughs> Right, well, up to that point, when the Titanic film came on, it was the biggest grossing film in all of history. And if you've seen the film, then I'm going to pass this round, you'll all know what this is. If you don't know what it is, naughty people, go and watch the film, because it really is very, very good. So uh, you'll probably recognise it as the heart of the ocean. 
and it is an exact replica of the one used in the film. In fact, you're in for a bit of a surprise about things just relating to the film later on. Basically, it's a love story, isn't it? Uh, but it's uh, centred upon an ill-fated ship, uh, and being the Titanic is what give it all the, uh, uh, you know, people wanting to watch it. It spawned lots of films, including Raise the Titanic, Lord Grade, A Night to Remember. Uh, there was the Titanic uh, starring Barbara Stanwyck. There was even a film made specially for TV called SOS Titanic. It shows that the Titanic is still of interest to people more than 100 years after it sank. So the question you might ask me is, why does it interest me? Why a conspiracy theorist? Why me? Well, I believe it is one of the greatest mysteries of the past. You're probably asking yourselves, what are these mysteries? Well, for now, I'm only going to tell you a couple. It's one, why this disaster has had such a tremendous effect on the minds of thousands of people who never even saw it. Think about that, we didn't even see it. Uh, is it perhaps because 1,500 plus people actually lost their lives on it? Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But you'd be wrong. Um, there's been lots of disasters since, with greater loss of life. Um, many people claimed to have had premonitions of the disaster forebodings about going on the voyage, which is rather unusual. Fourteen years before the Titanic, there was a fictional book written in 1898 that featured a triple screw ship called Titan that hit an iceberg and sank. It was a triple screw. Amazing coincidence that so close, just as if it was a premonition. But interesting though they are, uh, these are not the reason I'm including it amongst the greatest mysteries of the last millennium. I hope to show it deserves its place in its own right. A number of people believe that we should leave the Titanic alone and respect the dead. I do not. I think it should be fetched up because none of those people down there are resting in peace, as you may think. They're all very, very angry that they've lost their lives and relatives have lost their family because money was cut before safety, basically. I also have a number of personal interests in this case. For now, I'm only going to reveal one of them. It'll all be clear later on. Perhaps it was because I was actually born in the same street as Captain Smith. He was born in number 9 Well Street in Hanley, Stoke-on-Trent, and I was born in number 49. I used to talk to him. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I'll stop at that. <laughs> okay, the discovery of the wreck. So we all know that the famous Bob Ballard is the, uh, the man who finally found it in 1985. He discovered it at 2 a.m. local time, which is very close to the exact time that the Titanic sank. <laughs> the wreck of the Titanic and everything on it is currently owned by a company called Titanic Incorporated. All of the artifacts uh, that were brought up from the wreck since its discovery are in museums and none can be sold. Every year they have to apply to the American government for a new license to be the people that can go to the wreck. And it's granted on the absolute basis that nothing at all that's an artifact that comes up from that ship will be sold or profited in any way. It has to go into exhibitions or displays. So it's been saved for posterity really, which is wonderful. Uh, let's go further back and discover some of the history of the Titanic. And very importantly, her sister ship, the Olympic, and the White Star Line who owned them. Right, identical ships. It was decided at one of Lord Pirrie's dinner parties in 1907 to make a new class of vessels. They planned to build three. They were going to be the biggest ships in the world. Can you all hear me at the back, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. These monsters would cost £1.5 million each to build. Doesn't sound much today, does it? I mean, nearly everybody in this room owns a home that costs more than that, don't they? <laughs> so I've been told anyway. <laughs> they would be, by a comfortable margin, the largest vessels in the world. And the White Star Line expected the sheer size of the new ships to attract trade. The keel of the first of these ships was Olympic, 
and it was laid in 1908. Now, there's a lot of technical detail, which is why I need these notes here. So I hope you all pay attention. So obviously, I'll be asking questions after. If you don't pass the exam, you can't go home. Right. The hole was divided into 16 separate compartments, and the bulkheads were stronger than was required by Lloyd's insurance. Now, a lot of people say to me, you know, they skimped on this and they skimped on that and they didn't have the right number of lifeboats and they were, you know, they did all these things wrong. No, they didn't. They didn't do anything wrong at all. In fact, everything they did was over the top. This ship was built stronger and better and more well equipped than any ship afloat. That surprised me quite a lot. Uh, the hull contained no fewer than 29 supposedly watertight boxes, which is why they believe the ship was totally unsinkable, because you could fill up some of these compartments with millions of gallons of water and it would still float. With these arrangements, the vessel could remain afloat with any two major compart compartments flooded. And this was a great achievement, considering that the average boiler room was 57 foot long and 90 foot wide. Imagine filling that up with a kettle, it'd take you a while, wouldn't it? <laughs> the Olympic class ships had 10 steel decks. The wireless was supplied by Marconi, a company who guaranteed a range of 350 miles with a spark cap generator. What an accomplishment in those days. And you think we, today, in my pocket, I've got a television, a computer, a, it's a tele, I can speak to people in China, and all this sort of thing. You see my grandchildren in Derby without moving off spot. They had a little spark gap generator there, and they could reach 350 miles with it. The boat deck had 16 wooden lifeboats and two collapsible boats, C and D, resting on the top deck. Two more collapsible boats, A and B, were kept on top of the officers' cabins on either side of the forward funnel and they would be totally useless in an emergency because it takes forever and a day to try and untie them, unfasten them and get them down off the deck. Unlike the others that were all on davits, these were just placed by the thing. However, as you'll discover later on, they did manage to do so. Titanic, on the 31st of March 1909, Three months after the keel of the Olympic was laid, the keel of the Titanic was begun in Belfast. Side by side, the two monsters grew. Now what I'm going to do, there, there are pictures as well as my boring voice by the way, but I'm going to show the pictures together when I finish talking, because it's a lot easier to, I've tried this going between the two, and we end up off with all the wrong slides, and I, even I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing anyway, but here we go. So, they are in these two big ships side by side. Obviously, the Olympics coming along first because it, they started it first. However, shortly after la launching, while being towed to the fitting basin, Olympic, which is the first one they released, suffered her first accident. They don't like to talk about this because obviously it puts passengers off. A <coughs> gust of wind caught her, and as a result, she crashed into the dry dock wall denting some of the hull plates. At the end of seven months, on the 29th of May 1911, Olympic began her two days of sea trials. This is interesting because the Titanic only had one day. And you may be asking yourself why a bit later. She was handed over with full ceremony to her owners on the 31st of May. On this selfsame day, the Titanic was also launched. At about 4.30, Olympic left Belfast for Liverpool, where she's to be open to the public inspection for a day. So everybody had a chance to go and have a look at it before they booked passage. On the evening of the 1st of June, she departed from that port for Southampton to prepare for a maiden voyage under the Commodore of the White Star Fleet, Captain Edward John Smith. He was very important. He was actually retiring at the time. But they fetched him back for all this stuff because he was the best, the best captain in the world. He was also the highest paid, but more of that in a minute. During the last few moments of docking, Olympic had her second accident, backing into and almost sinking the tug, Hollenbach. It was not an auspicious beginning, was it? It's important to note here that the two ships appeared indistinguishable one from another. 
Then came the Hawk accident. So it hadn't finished, it's still having tribulations. At about lunchtime on the 20th of September 1911, Olympic had just left Southampton Harbour to begin her fifth, fifth voyage across the Atlantic and back. Aboard were about 1,313 passengers and 885 crew. To reach the open sea from the White Star Dock, the liner had to perform a number of tricky manoeuvres to avoid the sandbars. Uh, the liner then had to make a long S-turn. Even in 1912, merchant vessels were obliged to utilise the services of the Southampton River pilot. On this occasion, the pilot actually commanding Olympic was Captain William George Bower, a man with 30 years experience and who regularly supervised the initial stages of voyages by White Star vessels. So fully experienced and a very wise man is taking the Olympic out. Stood beside him is Captain Smith, who was the captain of the Titanic to take over later. Olympic speed was very carefully controlled during these manoeuvres, but later as it began to gain speed again, the lookout spotted another ship about four miles away, approaching at a good speed. Four miles ahead, sir! Ship. Frighten the life out of me. Right. <clears throat> the gap between the two <coughs> ships had closed to one and a half miles. The other ship was HMS Hawk, a Royal Naval armoured cruiser, captained by Commander William Frederick Blunt, RM. HMS Hawk was 7,350 ton warship, and beneath the waterline, the five inch thick armour of the cruiser hull had two torpedo tubes. Another important feature of this ship was a very big steel beak projecting out the front end beneath the water from the bow. And its purpose of the beak was to inflict the absolute maximum amount of damage on any opponent should the opportunity arise. It was especially built to ram things and cause an enormous amount of damage. Not normally as big as the Titanic though, of course, right? <laughs> Aboard Olympic, Captain Smith and Captain Bow watched anxiously as the warship began to make her turn in the wrong direction. Brilliant Navy. <laughs> bringing her onto a collision course. The Hawk had made an error and tried to rectify it by turning the wheel in the opposite direction, only to find that under such stress, it jammed three times. On the liner, Bower ordered the helm hard a port in an effort to swing the liner's stern clear of the rapidly approaching warship, but there was no time. Olympic's bow had swung only about seven degrees when the cruiser's hardened ram struck. The effect of an explosion was reinforced by clouds of paint and dust which were stripped from the Olympic by the impact. The hawk's bow only remained wedged in the liner's side for seconds before the Olympic's momentum slewed the cruiser's hull through the ear-shattering arc. The tremendous twisting movement sheared off the <coughs> hawk's underwater ram as she reeled away like a top. The hawk's bow was very badly damaged. Later on, I have pictures of this to show you. The Olympic was left with two gashes in her side. Only one large hourglass-shaped hole had been punctured in the side, eight foot deep, and extending well below the waterline, about 86 foot from the stern. Following the collision, Olympic hull plating required replacement over more than a third of the vessel's length. When you're talking about a ship of that length, there is a third of the length that to be replaced. The liner starboard main propeller was also badly damaged. 18 foot of the steel propeller shaft covering was crushed and torn, and the starboard uh, sorry, propeller shaft was bent and the crankshaft of the starboard engine was badly damaged. The impact must have given the starboard engine quite a jolt, which caused further structural damage. Luckily, there was no loss of life on either ship because the passengers on the Olympic were all dining at the time of the crash. Had they been in their cabins, there would have been an enormous loss of life. So you've got a gaping hole above and below the waterline in the side of the Olympic. Limping at very slow speed, the Orc was able to make the short journey back into Portsmouth Harbour. But Olympic was unable to return to Southampton until the tide had turned. So it dropped its anchor for the night, and she was joined by Redfull Line tug Vulcan, 
which would figure in the departure of a sister ship Titanic on the main voyage months later. It was painfully <coughs> obvious that Olympic's voyage could not be continued and so passengers were disembarked into tenders and had to find alternative means of reaching their destinations. The following morning, Thursday the 21st of September, Olympic was towed slowly back to Southampton Harbour where a cargo was discharged. Fortuitously, Arland and Wolf had a repair and maintenance facility at Southampton and it was here that Olympic underwent an inspection but was found to be beyond the capabilities of the yard to repair it. She would need to return to Belfast to the only dry dock in the world large enough to receive her. Before she could attempt the 370 mile voyage, the extensive damage to her hull had to be temporarily patched up. She departed Southampton on Wednesday 4th of October, able to steam on just her port main engine. Olympic crept into Belfast and dropped anchor at 11 a.m. on the 6th. They had great difficulty in getting her into the dry dock. She was not again repaired until the 20th of November. You're probably wondering why I'm rattling on about the Olympic. You'll find out in a minute if you'll bear with me, please. Only two days after the collision, there was a Royal Navy Court of Inquiry. Unsurprisingly, it found all the blame for the accident lay with the White Star vessel, <laughs> which was slowly drifting out to the harbour at the time when it rammed it inside. All the, witness, all the witnesses were naval personnel, and White Star were not allowed to be represented. It was a fair trial, wasn't it? But, uh, you could say it was a stitch-up. Uh, White Star appealed several times, but lost, and were left to foot the bill. They even took it to the House of Lords on the November the 9th, 1914, and you can imagine what the House of Lords said. How much is this boat cost? 1.5 million. How much do you think they'll want to put that right? We haven't got that kind of money. It wasn't our fault anyway, was it? It's quite obvious uh, that it come round and rammed our, our naval destroyer. So they lost. <coughs> Repairs and lost fares from these cancelled voyage had left White Star more than £250,000 out of pocket. Uh, you've got to bear in mind that it's RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic, Royal Mail Ship. So they were getting a £250,000 uh, fee every year just for taking the, the mail across the Atlantic. So all that came to an end rapidly when the ship was tied up there and damaged. So they were losing some money and they raked out quite a lot to, to get this far. To add to the problems, any attempt to repair Olympic would mean diverting the workers from completing the Titanic. The official end to the story is that she was repaired and Olympic went back into service and on her fourth two-way crossing after her repair, shortly after leaving New York, guess what? She struck what appeared to be a submerging office. <laughs> I'd rather sail on the Titanic, I'll be honest with you, because this has had five accidents up to now. Uh, it's sub a submerged wreck. <coughs> lost a blade from her port main propeller. Now that's very important. Uh, They've got this blade, a propeller blade, and it's the size of this room that you're in, the blade. So we are talking about quite a big uh, monstrosity. Uh, and it had to be replaced. Now they can't quickly, you know, knock up one of these uh, propellers. It takes months. So what they did, they borrowed one off the incomplete uh, Titanic, and they put it on there. So Olympic actually had, uh, oh, by the way, the ships were numbered. Right, and it was 01 and 02, so they put, put the propeller off the uh, Titanic onto the Olympic. So it had one wrong propeller. That's worth remembering. After disembarking the passengers in Southampton, Olympic made her way to Belfast for repairs to the damaged propeller arriving on the 1st of March 1912. Right, at this point, I want you all to think of yourselves as one of the directors of the company White Star Line, right? Here we are, we've, we've had an accident that wasn't our fault at all, quite obviously. It was the fault of the uh, British Navy. They've done us, absolutely done us. We went, we went even to their House of Lords and they've done us here. It's a complete fiddle. So we've got no insurance, we've got no money off it and they cost us an arm and a leg. Now, here's our problem. We've got two boats side by side out here in the dock. 
they're identical. Do we take all the men that we've got, because that's where they all are, working on the Titanic trying to finish it, do we stop trying to finish it and go take them over and repair the Olympic and put that back into service? Or do we carry on working on the Titanic and launch that first and worry about the other one after? Now it's at this point that one of you very smart directors is going to say, I wish we could get our money back off that insurance. You know, it's wrong. We could be able to pay for the Britannic, which is the next one we want to build, and everything. It's completely wrong. It's a pity there wasn't a, it wasn't an accident that we could get the claim the insurance on. There's thoughts like that go through your mind at all, you know? Uh, I've got an idea, says some director. I don't know which one of you it was, but very naughty. So why don't we uh, swap the two ships over, right? Set sail and run it into the ice. It can't sink. It's perfectly safe. There's no no problem bumping ice with this thing. It's it's you know totally unsinkable. But do it right in the middle of the ocean, where it's the deepest part, where nobody will ever be able to get to it and have a look at it. Why don't we bump it with the ice, have one of our own ships following it close by, radio for help, because we've bumped the ice and it's sinking, come over and spend two days taking the passengers quietly off onto our other ship, and then scuttle that and let it go down and collect the insurance. Now, does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> It does, does it? Right. Well, this is where the conspiracy comes in, you see. And there is never smoke without there's some fire, fire, unless there's some smoke, rather. Right? And this is what I find. People say to me, it's ridiculous. All the, all the conspiracies I look at, they're all ridiculous. Well, they would be if there weren't anomalies. If there wasn't strange things going on and things wrong with it, there wouldn't be a conspiracy. Believe you me, is there something wrong with this? And as you're going to find out in a moment. Uh, so that's a decision you have to make. And the decision you'll still have to make is whether they actually did that or not. I don't believe, even if they meant to do it, that was any intention that anybody should be hurt in any way. Just a, a gentle bump into the ice, which wouldn't do anything to the Titanic. Ship everybody off onto the other boat, sink the other one quietly sail away, what a wonderful job we've done, claim the insurance for it, which they'd then be entitled to do, and so on. Right, let's uh, move on a minute. This is, of course, the wreck of the Titanic as Ballard found it, and uh, I've actually got all these in 3D pictures of that, which are pretty thrilling, but I can't show you tonight, obviously. Here we have the HMS Orc. Now, you can't see the big... Uh, iron nose that sticks out the front of it because the Olympic managed to rip it clean off as you can see from that so you can imagine what a bit of a bump this was and the sort of impact that was made and there you can see uh, chaps in a boat trying to find out just how bad the damage is and at the top there you can see the hole at the top but underneath the water is a hole twice as big as that fortunately as I say it's not going to fill all the ship up because the water goes into the one compartment and it's okay. Uh, give you some idea, Dan. There's a chap standing at the bottom there. Can anybody see them pictures at the back? Yeah. Get your binoculars on. <laughs> right, there we are. You need a look out. And uh, here you can see more of the damage. Uh, that's the damage to the Olympics propeller. Look at the edge of the propeller up there. You can't sail like that. It's absolutely useless. It's quite a bit of a quite a bit of damage to it. If you have some idea of the size, there are the chaps at the back there. And uh, here we're looking at the Olympics damage bed. Um, <laughs> ships are designed specifically to run into things at the front. That's true. It's like a motor car. It is designed to take an impact from the front. It's when you get into the, hit in the side, your problems arise. So any, any amount of damage, that, that ship could have had a hole in the front of there going all the way back to the to the mast and it would have still been fine because it crumples at the front and there's nothing there of any impulse no engines or anything in, in the front of it and here you can see some of the woodwork they had to put up the side of it uh, to get it from Southampton back up to up to its yard <coughs> 
there's the two ships uh, side by side. We're in here somewhere. I've got something that tells me what all these slides are, so we'll just make sure we're right. Uh, you're looking here at the Olympic on the right, painted white, ready for launch. What they decided to do is uh, that they would paint it white when they launched it because it looked better on photographs and it would be easier to see and so on. It was never sailed to be white, but, but when, when they first launched it, and of course it didn't have any funnels or anything on it, they launch it, then they take it round to an improving yard where they, they stick all the funnels and the bits and pieces on it and all the wonderful things that were inside it. And uh, what I want you to note here, if you can see, let me just get up a moment. Down the edge of the bow here are portals. And if you were to be able to see them from the back of there, you'd be able to count them and find there was exactly 14 of those there. Quite clearly it says Olympic on there. And this is the Olympic, it's painted white got no folds on, it's just been launched and it's got 14 portals on there. Now, I will tell you that all these pictures are Holland and Wolf's own pictures. They're not ones I've knocked up or doctored in any way, shape or form. They're Holland and Wolf pictures and they have titled them and that is Olympic. Okay? Here is the Olympic at fitting out. I also want you to notice that it's actually got square windows. You won't see them from the back. Take my word for it until you get a better picture. But all these little windows along here are perfectly square and they're perfectly even spaced. This is Olympic, uh, sorry, Olympic that's finished and it's on her maiden voyage. Um, she's got 14 portals on this picture. It's quite clear and easy to see. <coughs> that it's got the 14 portholes, you might even be able to count them from the back. And you'll also see that it's got square windows here running along there. Obviously, having the pictures in your hand and a magnifying glass uh, makes a bit of a difference, but uh, you'll take my word for it, I'm not cheating in any way, okay? Uh, this is Olympic photograph to Queenstown, and magically, magically, Somehow, during a voyage or during whatever, they've managed to add an extra porthole in the side of the bow. Now, if you know anything about shipping, you know you can't cut a hole into one inch thick steel plate hull of a ship and add a porthole into it while it's uh, in transmission anywhere. So, you've got to ask yourself, and people have rang up all and Wolf and said, Are you sure? That's the Olympic there. Why has he got 16 portals in there? I won't tell you what the answer's come. <laughs> right, there again you can see clearly, and as I say, you get your magnifying glass out, and you'll see that those are squared windows, perfectly uniform, <coughs> along there. Just point it out to, you won't see, can't count them from there, but perhaps somebody in the front will I admit, can, can you see that at once? Am I telling the truth? Oh, yeah. There we are then, okay. 16 portals, see two together there, on there, and then these nice even portals there. I was say, there's no smoke bird fire. Right, on the 16th of October, Titanic, they're both ships are together again here. Titanic is in the background, Olympic is in the foreground, and it's got the wrong <coughs> amount of portals on it. Are you wrong, Orlando Wolf? Are they the other way round? Oh no, no, no. Definitely not, no, you're looking at them the right way around, yeah. yeah. Just the portals keep changing over on their own when you're not watching. You have to be very careful with these ships. Now, we come to the Titanic. You must have heard enough of the Olympic now. Okay, here she is, being built. Uh, Titanic quite clearly written on there. And the portals very clearly seen up there. Uh, this is immediately after launch. Note, will you, that she's got 14 portos along there, right? <coughs> uh, this could not be the Olympic under any circumstances because she was painted white when she was launched. And as you can see from this, that is not white. She hasn't been, you know, to, on a maiden sail yet because she hasn't even got a funnel on it. So it can't do much. It's been round to the yard and they're fitting it all out. 
Uh, pictures in the newspapers. That's a daily graphic. Right. This is the Titanic soon after she was launched. Uh, they've now covered in the upper deck B. Um, they felt that uh, with the Olympic that uh, people were, the, the first class passengers were getting a bit drafty when they walked onto the deck. So what they thought they'd do is, well, we'll cover that in a bit to protect them. Here we can clearly see 16 portals on the Titanic. Remember a minute ago, it had 14 portals. Well, now it's got 16 portals. It's a miracle. <laughs> this is the best picture I've got, which shows you the nice square windows. Let's go and have a quick look. Here they go, all evenly spaced, square windows. You can't mistake that, can you? Can you see that at the back even? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll win then. <laughs> right, definitely Titanic. It's unfinished, it's not even painted, and it's got alterations to B and C. Note, square windows are now together. Not as you can see very well on this picture, but... Uh, you get magnifying glass and the, uh, the original pictures out and you'll see that, but I might have better ones. Uh, here we've got the Olympic, uh, which is neither ship. It's got the wrong amount of portals, it's got the wrong type of windows, it's got the wrong covered in deck. It's absolutely half and half. It hasn't been altered, but it's neither one or the other. Here they are together for the last time. And this is when we made our decision as to whether we might, you know, accidentally swap the two boats over and uh, sail one out. When the accident happened with the Hawk, as you saw from the original pictures, there was damage to the Olympic at the front end where it had hit the boat. So they actually had to let in joint plates in the front to, to, to repair it, plates in there. And this picture, you can actually clearly see them, you can even count them. I won't bore you to death, you need to get all these pictures together on. It took me months of going with magnifying glasses and ringing people to get to get to the bottom of all this. But there, it's clear that it's had the joint plates put in. Here, and magically, right, the Olympic, uh, after that event, has not got the joint plates put in. We've got disappearing joint plates on the bow of the ship now. Right? It, it, you know, it's, the miracles that occur to boats is incredible. Um, here's the Titanic. You can't see it on my picture because I, I really can't reproduce them to get them up on here any good. You need to see the original photographs. But it hasn't actually got any joints on there, on this picture. Bear in mind that these are Holland and Wolf's own pictures. <laughs> It's no good them saying, well, you've done so many of the pictures, or that isn't the boat. They've told me these are their pictures. Titanic's now completed, and she leaves for Portsmouth, ready for a maiden voyage. Paired windows and 16 portals. <laughs> Leaving Southampton, still got the 16 portals and the paired windows. A good view of Titanic's portals. Now, if it, you know them square windows that are all even? That's them. Can anybody see that there's two together there? Yeah. Yeah. Right? They're not all even, there's two together there. What happened to the square windows that were all along the top of there, all evenly spaced? And the 14 portals, and they've got 16 with two pairs. No, there's not a conspiracy. <laughs> and that, of course, is the beautiful Titanic. And she was beautiful. There's no doubt about that, whatever. <coughs> right. I'll just check. I've got everything that I should be showing you there. Ah. When Bob Ballard goes down there and starts filming the ship at the bottom of the ocean, he takes this photograph of the propeller. On tight, these are tight, and down, Titanic sunk down there. Bob, down he goes in his submarine thing and he gets his camera out and he takes that picture of one of the uh, propellers 
on the, on the Titanic. <coughs> now, it should have, because it was the second boat they built, O2 on it. It was everything on the, the uh, Titanic, it's got O2 on it. If you make a wooden shelf, it's got O2 <coughs> on the back. Because all the bits are the same for all three boats. So they had to know which one they were, but it didn't, but it didn't matter. If they made a vase to go on this one, it was the same vase on every single one. That's why they thought they could make it cheaper, because they like mass producing. Instead of trying to design three boats, get three lots of plans, get three lots of workmen in three different times to make, they make all the same thing for all three boats in one go. Now, Arland and Wolf told me directly, because they've told others, but they told me directly, because I absolutely had to know it. said, is that O1 on that propeller? No, it isn't. It's seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> Honest, that is not O1 on the, O.1 on the propeller. That is caused by sea, what's it, you know, uh, crustacea on the propeller. Now obviously, I'm not telling you that it isn't, right? But if you could convince me, you'd really be going some, because, you know, I'm willing to stretch quite a way, but I can't stretch that far. I don't know about you. Can you stretch that that isn't 0.1 on there? Amazing how they trained that crustacea to look exactly like it, didn't it? It's absolutely ridiculous. So there we have that. Okay. Now if I can just get back to where I was in my notes, because this is very, very important. I don't know how many of you there is in the room, but if while I'm looking for my notes, you like to pass one of these out, so I'm going to invite you all now on a cruise. And this is an original ticket, a copy of the original ticket the passengers got. Have one each and keep it as a souvenir. I'm sorry if I don't have enough for everybody. I was expecting an handful of you to come and hear this talk. And as they'd advertise it on posters and put my name on, I thought that might have been down to five. But uh, there seems to be a few more of you, which is very nice. But uh, Right. Now, the best evidence that we could possibly have would be first-hand evidence. But that, as you know, is impossible. Uh, there are no survivors now of the Titanic. Melvin Nadine died a few years ago, and she was the very last survivor. So there is no more people that actually sailed. Mind you, she was a, a baby at the time of the the Titanic, so she wouldn't have been much use giving us information. So it seems hopeless that we're ever going to get first-hand information. Well, I discovered not. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear a different story of the Titanic, but from a very, very reliable eyewitness who I brought along with me. So I'll give you all a ticket, so we're on the voyage. Uh, I'm going to have to take this off. If I may, just for a moment. Sorry about that, Ted. You definitely know because you've got earphones. <laughs> just go and get this uh, chap off the Titanic for you a minute. We'll just bear with me a second. <laughs> <laughs> We don't do things by half, you know. <laughs> Hence the black tie. <coughs> and yes, that is the real White Star Line hat. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. I'm going to be a mythical person tonight. I'm going to be a quartermaster on the Titanic.
my background. I am G. Rowe. I am able-bodied seaman, age 32. <laughs> yes, I am. Right. I'm from 32, sorry, 63 Henry Street, Gosport in Hampshire. I served in the Royal Navy for 15 years before I joined the Merchant Marines in 1910, when I immediately began signing aboard White Star ships. I worked on liners Majestic and Oceanic before joining the Titanic. Just prior to the Titanic's maiden voyage, I'd completed an advanced quartermaster's course. Part of the syllabus had been determining the distances between illuminated vessels at night. This turned out to be very fortuitous, a skill that would turn out useful later on. Uh, did they always get that training, one asked oneself, right? Or was this special? I don't know. I keep on, you know, thinking about the conspiracies. What were my duties? I was one of only 22 able-bodied. Remember, there was 880-odd people, you know. But only 22 of them were able-bodied seamen. My duties as quartermaster included taking the log readings. Now the log is the thing they drag behind the boat. <coughs> and it works out how fast they're going. And it's from how fast they're going that they work out where they are. Okay, so the distance they've travelled is measured on the log. And as the quartermaster, that was my duty to take the log readings every day. And therefore give the captain information about how far we've gone in the journey. I steer the ship, occasionally, uh, depending on who's available, so I'm actually you know, in control of it quite often. I'm responsible for signals and signalling on the ship. When I'm not doing any of these duties, such as when we are docked, I also help with the passengers and their inquiries and direct them around the ship. Yes, madam, it's a third door on the left down there into the first class <laughs> Including their dogs, by the way, because a lot of people brought their dogs with them. There were about 30 dogs on board the Titanic on its maiden voyage. Even Captain Smith had one, had his own dog. There was even a dog show planned for the 14th. I, like most of the crew, normally work four-hour watches. That is, four hours on and six hours off. Right from the moment we set sail, I knew that there was something wrong. There were lots of little things that didn't add up. For example, all of the senior crew knew that there was a raging coal fire in forward coal bunker number 10, even before Titanic got to Southampton. Though the coal fires are quite rare on ships, they are known to happen with their attendant possibility of explosion. Coal dust is very explosive. What is really strange though, was that the very efficient Board of Trade Inspector failed to spot that one of the holes was ablaze. He inspected the ship, fit for the duty, but he didn't see that the hole was on fire. It was hot and blistering. He passed it fit for passenger service. He would have had to be blind to have missed it, I thought, at the time. But even stranger, instead of putting the fire out on the dockside at Portsmouth, where they had every capability to deal quickly with such problems, they loaded more coal on top of the fire, <laughs> thus stoking it up. They then took on 12 extra crewmen to control the fire. Say there's no smoke without... You can imagine the smoke from this. Another little incident that makes no sense was the refusal to issue binoculars to the lookouts after they requested them. As they moaned to me, I was custom, it was customary for all White Star lookouts to be given binoculars when on duty. It had taken two full days of sea trials to test the Olympic, but less than one day to test the Titanic. I was also very surprised when the vessel's owner, J.P. Morgan, cancelled his passage for the maiden voyage aboard his new ship at the last minute. Here he is with a ship that's one of the biggest in the world on its maiden voyage with all the publicity in the world coming down to see it but he chose not to be on it 
Even the bronze statue of Mr. Morgan, which should have been loaded aboard the ship and on display, was somehow overlooked and left on the quayside. Well, we don't want that damage, do we? From the start and throughout the voyage, Titanic had a persistent list to starboard. Ships leaning on its maiden voyage. Apart from these oddities, the voyage got off to quite a normal start. Children playing, people exploring this massive ship. There was plenty to keep them occupied with a fully fitted gymnasium, Turkish baths, a swimming pool, which by the way was the only second ship in the world ever to have a swimming pool on board, as well as all the usual entertainments, and not forgetting the main pastime of any good cruise, eating. We were carrying people of every age group, from babies to the retired. Even so, every social class was represented, each in their own areas. We had no less than six real millionaires aboard. Six millionaires aboard the ship. Later, I found out that their total wealth was 90 million pounds. The Titanic only cost one and a half million to build. I worked it out that these six men could have bought themselves 60 ships like the one they were on between them. Now that is wealth. Yes. While I'm on the subject of money, I can tell you that Captain Smith, Commodore of the White Star Line, was the highest paid sailor on the seas at the time, and he got a massive £1,250 a year. <laughs> Don't knock it, that is a tremendous amount of money at the time, in 1912. I was earning a goodly sum myself. I got six pound a month. <laughs> but then, of course, I was an officer. Yeah. <laughs> Whilst the likes of the stewardesses, they were on three pounds and ten shillings a month. So there's a job going if anybody still wants one. <laughs> it may be of interest if I tell you that the cabin suite on this ship, so if you were one of the better off and you could afford a cabin on there, Eight hundred and seven pounds, <coughs> and there's no shortage to take us. So you've got this girl slaving away at everybody's beck and call for three pounds ten a month, while well, they paid eight hundred and seven pounds just for a cabin. I was on duty at the wheel on my four till six watch, and sometime between five forty-five and five fifty. Half an hour after she would normally have made the manoeuvre, I was ordered to change the Titanic's course onto more northerly heading. This worried me greatly because this is the wrong course for that time of the year. You see, every year the ice flow starts to come down from the north, down the middle of the Atlantic. And all ships, when it reaches a certain date, right, are asked to avoid it by sailing down the Atlantic round the ice flow and back up a bit. Of course it takes a little bit longer but of course it avoids the ice altogether. And so it was that time of the year when Titanic should have been sailing down and round the ice but no, the captain ordered me to steer the ship straight across. We received several warnings from other ships of ice and icebergs as we headed straight towards the ice flow. Though the captain and the principals of the company aboard were well aware of these reports and the danger they posed, we maintained our high speed and held course for the ice. For me, the beginning of the sequence that led to the end of this great ship began on the evening of April the 14th when I was on duty on the poop deck. That's a bit at the back of the boat that gives you a view that's, that's got a balcony that leans out over the ship and if you go on the ends of it you can see right down the ship and in front of it. I was stationed on the aft docking bridge, a raised structure on the stern of the ship. We were travelling at 22 knots on a heading of a north 71 degrees west. I was later called to testify this at a trial boon or later. As there was little to do I passed the time talking to the passengers. Paced up and down to keep warm, it was very cold and ice had formed on all the rigging. It's cold when it does that. I noted that the log indicated we had covered 260 nautical miles since it had been reset at midday, confirming that she was still averaging something in the region of 22 knots. So we weren't gliding quietly towards the ice. We were on basically full speed 
going straight for it. This reading later turned out to be the most important one I had ever taken as it was used to determine the last position of the ship prior to its sinking. After a while, I saw an iceberg glide past the docking bridge where I stood. It was just like a windjammer, sorry, a large sailing ship, with sails the colour of wet canvas. I estimated that the iceberg was a good hundred foot high. I was close to the it was close to the ship, almost touching it. I must also have been overhanging as the rigging had brought down showers of ice onto the deck, which others estimated would have weighed several tons. There was a slight job, but I didn't think much more about it at the time, as the iceberg did not appear to have made any real contact with the ship. I reasoned that the slight jarring might have been the propeller put into reverse to stop the ship. I looked at my watch. It was a fine night, and it was 20 minutes to 12, 20 minutes to midnight. Suddenly I noticed that we had stopped engines. I looked towards the starboard side of the ship, and saw a mass of ice. I then remained on the after bridge to await orders through the telephone, but no orders came down. And I remained there until 25 minutes past midnight when I saw a boat aft on the starboard beam. So I telephoned the bridge. It was 4th Officer Boxall who replied. I told him I'd just seen a lifeboat in the water. Boxall expressed his surprise as he'd heard no order had been given to lower any of the boats. He instructed me to bring some rockets to the bridge. He told me that he had seen the lights of a vessel in the distance and that Captain Smith had given permission for rockets to be sent up as signals of distress. They sent the assistant helmsman, Quartermaster Oliver, to help me carry the mortar shell rockets which were stored where I was on the boot deck. We each collected a box of 12 shells and headed for the bridge. Though I hurried to comply with my orders, it still took me a while to pick up the rockets and travel the length of the ship. It's like walking from here down to the, the main road. It's an enormous distance, up and down steps and all the rest of it. And where I reported to the bridge. I suppose it was during this time that the grim reality of the serious state we were in first started to sink in. Aided by Officer Boxall, I began to send up the rockets. The first one was in the air about 12.45. I continued to fire them at five or six minute intervals according to Captain Smith's instructions. Between firing rockets, I attempted to signal the vessel using a Morse lamp, but no ship responded. I was convinced that it was a sailing ship I could see, two points off the port bow at a distance of no more than four miles. Gradually, the light diminished and finally disappeared. Because Titanic was stationary, I could easily tell the mystery vessel was clearly moving away. The special training that I had received in judging the distance of ships in this sort of situation just prior to the voyage was already being put to good use. As soon as the passengers saw the rockets, they realized the danger they were in. But there was no panic and everyone seemed to be acting in a sensible manner. People were responding to the orders of the crew. According to my reckoning, I continued to fire rockets until 2025, by which time Officer Boxall had left to take command of lifeboat 14. A few minutes later, Captain Smith instructed me to take charge of collapsible lifeboat C. Now this is one of them canvas ones that's stuck on top of his cabin that's almost impossible to get off. So you can imagine the problem that I had and the few people that were helping me to get this down off the top of here and anywhere near likely to be able to launch it over the side of the ship as was nothing to launch it with. By now there was much confusion and some panic with people trying to get places in the boats. The officers had actually shot several passengers, possibly as many as eight or more. I saw this with my own eyes. With no response to his repeated calls for women and children, Chief Officer Wilde gave the order to lower away. Mine was the last boat to be lowered from the starboard side at 1.40. Although I didn't know it at the time, it was the last lifeboat to leave the sinking ship. As it began its long descent down the side of the ship, two male first class passengers quietly stepped in. 
No one had told them they could get in. I immediately recognised one of them as Mr. Joseph Ismay, Chairman and Managing Director of the White Star Line. Oh, God, he's got in my boat. <laughs> I knew I had to be on my metal with a big boss on board. Can you just, just imagine it? <coughs> like, like the Queen has, you know, stepped into your kitchen all of a sudden and, uh, you know, you, you carry on, just do as you normally do. You can, can you imagine the panic? I knew I had to be on my metal with the big boss aboard. It's worth remembering here that there had to be someone left on deck to lower my boat and that there was no boat left for them to leave in. That night, there were many true heroes and a few real cowards. The situation had brought out both the very best in human spirit and also the worst. But it's hard to judge any individual under the terrible conditions that they found themselves in. At one point, I thought we weren't even going to make it to the water, as the Titanic was now listing some six degrees to port, which meant we were trying to slide the lifeboat down a slope. So when the boat was like that, and they're launching it, they're not hanging over the water, they're sliding down the side of the ship. Now the straits all across this, the straits all across the ship, that these, you know, uh, lengths, and, and it's made of plates, it isn't smooth, it's, it's all iron plates an inch thick. So every time they come to one of these things, they're trying to push it off. There we were with the oar, trying to push the boat off the, these strakes to get it to go down. So it, 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 we didn't think we'd make the water, to be honest. At the time my boat was being lowered, the rubbing strake kept on catching on the rivets. And it was as much as we could do to keep her off. When the boat was in the water, the well deck was actually submerged. It took us five minutes to the lower boat on the count of this rubbing going down. Once we were in the water and free of the ship, though I was nominally in command, but as a matter of courtesy to my big chief in the boat, I asked his mate what I should do. He blurted out, you do what the hell you like, you're in charge. <laughs> and then he lapsed into silence, neither speaking nor moving for the remainder of the night. When the Titanic went down, it seemed only fitting to make some sort of gesture. I removed my cap and all my mates touchingly doffed their caps. This mate didn't even bother to turn round. Contrary to his own testimony, he never longed a hand on the oars. Fortunately, the water was like a mill pond and there was little by way of wind, which is just as well or we would not have made it. The water temperature was minus two degrees and survival in the water was at best 20 minutes. We steered for the light, but try as we may, we couldn't make any progress. I wondered if the light was on a ship going away from us. In the end, we were forced to change course and headed towards a boat that was carrying a green light. In all the previous turmoil, I had not really had a chance to see who had got in the boat. Near daybreak, we found that we had four Chinese or Filipino stowaways who had come up from between the seats. <laughs> Never mind women and children first. <laughs> Though my collapsible lifeboat had the capacity for 49 people, I counted only 39. Over and over again, I asked myself, where are all the people? My survivors were mostly third-class passengers. Two male first-class passengers, five crew including myself, three firemen, a steward and all the rest were women and children. One of the first-class passengers was William Ernest Carter and the other was J. Bruce Ismay. When day finally broke, the ship Carpathia was in sight and what a welcome sight it was. The passengers were almost frozen to death and many in a state of deep shock. Almost every one of them had lost at least one loved one. We had endured the terrible screams and the pitiful cries of hundreds of people dying. And watched a beautiful dream ship become a nightmare and go to the bottom of a still cold ocean. Now it was light, we could see ice and icebergs all around us that were invisible a while ago. We'd been so lucky in our flimsy canvas and wood boat not to have suffered damage by hitting them. 
After we were removed from the boat, collapsible lifeboat sea that had been our saviour was cut and left the drift. Once on board the Carpathia, Ismay raced down to the dining room, demanded that he be fed instantly and tipped the astonished steward who served him two dollars. It was then that he retired to the surgeon's cabin from which he did not emerge until the ship reached New York. He wasn't going to face any of the passengers. The passengers and crew aboard the Carpathia were kindness itself, and many of the passengers gave their personal possessions and clothing to us survivors. Bear in mind that we were all soaking wet, freezing cold, in a really traumatic state. Considering the final toll of souls lost, I consider myself to be a very, very lucky. A number of dogs were saved, by the way. Later, I was called to testify at the inquiries, one in New York and the other in Britain. The Titanic's owners, White Star Line, were finally able to receive full compensation and the insurance for the loss of the ship and were able to fund the building of their third great liner, Britannic. The Olympic carried on sailing for another 37 years. What happened to me? When all the inquiries were over, I continued my merchant service, serving on the hospital ship Plassey with the Great Fleet during the First World War. I then worked for Thornycroft Ship Repairs in Southampton until I was 80. During that time, I was in charge of fitting Denny Brown stabilizers to the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, amongst other things. I received the British Empire Medal, BEM, in 1960s for service to Thornycroft. I died in 1974 at the age of 91. Now, we said we wanted, you know, an eyewitness here. Every word I have just related to you, every single word accurately, the quartermaster's account came directly from his own lips. Every word I've said came from his own lips and was recorded at the courts of inquiry. When I was writing this talk, I wanted to play the part of a survivor to tell the story. I thought it would be better if I could play the part and tell you rather than just read some dumb notes said. But it was no good being a passenger because they didn't know any of the technicalities. They couldn't have told you about the rockets and the ship and all that. I couldn't be Captain Smith because unfortunately he didn't survive. His last words to the men were, be British. Be British. So I chose the crew member who gave the ship's last position, who fired the distress rockets, who saved the chairman and managing director of the White Star Line and was the last man to leave the Titanic. Who was this man? I nearly fell off the chair. This man was G. Rowe, the quartermaster. <laughs> you can't make it up. I'm telling you, the weirdest things happen to me when I'm doing these things. And that is it. But ladies and gentlemen, tonight, because during my researches, I need to find a lot of things. I'm trying to build a nine-foot model, by the way, of the Titanic. <laughs> you know, I need a second life for it. But uh, I brought along a few items from my uh, collection. You can't have, remember, anything actually from the Titanic because it can never be sold. So some of the items that I've got are priceless. Absolutely. They look nothing. But they cost an arm and three legs, and some can't be bought. Okay, if you'd like to come over, I don't know how we're going to do this, perhaps in single file or a little, I don't know, around. I've got this exhibition out here. Perhaps we could have this on here, somebody could. Uh, Excuse me, anybody? could I just say something? Yes, sir. My grandfather, Captain Robin, Robert Jones, was a captain with White Star and Cunard Lines. Wow. And the court of inquiry, he was summoned not to give evidence, along with other captains, to give his opinion as to what happened wow. to the Titanic. 
And so I would love to see the court papers. Right. I should imagine they're in the Liverpool archives. You, you can get them. You can get them in different books. They're repeated in several yes. books. But later, if you yeah. let me some information. I'll tell you which books I get the information from, because obviously I ought to get this information, but it is direct the transcript from the actual... But I honestly believe they changed the Titanic and Olympics name on each ship. Well, I leave that to you. I'm not here to tell you this. I'm here to offer you the, uh, the conspiracy theory, right? And you may think what you wish. Actually, I believe that really is the Titanic down there. Yes. But based upon more evidence that uh, I'm unable to present here to, tonight, it's a complex business. Um, but if, I don't know how we're going to do this, but if we can find a way, I would ask you to try and avoid falling over wires, injuring before yourself. We, uh, away. Before we start to get up and move around, um, two things. If we can A, do the raffle, and B, I'd like to offer my thanks to. Uh, uh, to Gary tonight for uh, the presentation. Uh, leave you to go away and uh, consider what's being said, uh, and I'll leave you to decide on the conspiracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First ticket is a green one. It's 116 to 120. 116 to 120. Right at the back. Is that you, Vic? No, he said 60, no, 116. 116. No, sorry, no, Not yours, right. Green, 116. There we are. Tim. Tim. Jelly babies, wine. <laughs> <laughs> Pass that back, please, to Tim. You might get it full, but you might not. Green, 41, 45. Green, 41, 45. Lady round the corner. Um, we've got jelly babies. We've got smelly. Uh, um, we've got a calendar. Uh, we've got the napkins and the uh, uh, and uh, the light. That gives us a detail. Blue, 966 to 970 on the blue. Lady I was. Calendar, jelly babies, or smellies. I don't know how to do this with so many people, but in here, when they were making the, sorry, when they were making the film, the Titanic, they wanted to get everything right, and they found out the people who made the car uh, that still made them in the And these are samples. Kate Winslet oh, bought from these pieces of car. Green, 101. Yes? They are the real ones. Made on the same name, same car. Same design. Right, yes. The last one will be the jelly baby. Right, yes. Green, 101. So you need the light. Yeah. Yeah. 946 to 950 on blue. 946 to 950 on blue. Yes. 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 Yes, that's worth doing. You might never get another chance. That's worth having. You can sell them, isn't it? Do you want me to go? Shall I go beyond you? Yeah. This small case didn't go to the top. The water filled up and we went over the top of it, which like this metal in here is a replica. I tried to buy one of the bronze ones, um, but they wanted three and a half thousand for it, so I give up on that. This is a replica, right?
the famous unsinkable Molly Brown, uh, when she was rescued by the Carpathia, she collected money off all the survivors and had medals made for all the crew of the Carpathia. The captain got this gold one, the senior officers got silver ones, and the rest of the crew got bronze ones. So that really is a photograph of her, that's a captain, and, the, and the, this is a perfect replica of the original. I don't know how, you, how we got...